Well, I just want to say thank you so much, church family, for allowing me to be up here. And thank you so much, Brother Chapel. And I'm just so honored to be here with you tonight and to be able to stand before you and in this pulpit and preach God's word. And um, just several weeks ago, um, after service, I was standing out in the lobby and a lady approached me and she was just so happy and she shook my hand and she said, thank you so much for that sermon. And you were just such a blessing to my heart. And I simply replied, ma'am, that was Brother Choi, but, you know, it may have been the suit I was wearing or I don't know what was wrong with that, but truly I am honored to preach before you tonight. And, you know, I want to thank Pastor for allowing me to stand behind this sacred desk and to deliver God's word. And I do not take that lightly. And, you know, I have the opportunity to serve alongside Pastor. And I just want to let you know, church family, that you have a pastor that truly cares for you. And he prays for you a lot and he loves you so much. And I just want to encourage you as he's coming back in the next couple of weeks or whenever he comes back that you would just meet him out in the West Wing lobby and you can come shake his hand and just let him know how thankful you are to him and maybe write him a note or something. And I know that that would be a huge blessing to him. But if you have your Bible, would you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40? Isaiah chapter 40. Tonight I want to bring you a message entitled, a fresh encounter with waiting. A fresh encounter with waiting. Isaiah chapter 40. And we're going to begin reading here in verse 28. And it says this. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the end of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. No one likes waiting. No one likes to wait. If you are in here this night and you like to wait, then you are weird. I mean, just, it's, just, it's just not normal. You know, waiting, if you, waiting is hard. It's, it's uncomfortable. And, you know, I might some, trigger some people in here. But So here's your warning. But I thought through some of the worst places that I hate to wait in. And number one is the DMV. Oh my goodness, you know, you just wait. If you love waiting for four hours and just wasting time, go to the DMV. It's the perfect place for you. And secondly, I thought through Costco during Christmas season. You know, it's like a war zone in there. You know, you're just taking all this stuff off the cart and you're protecting your cart. And, you know, you're waiting like an hour in line to just check out your items. And, you know, some other places, amusement parks, maybe the airport, a traffic stop, maybe traffic on the 14. And there's just plenty of places where it's just a worse time to wait. But personally, I think the worst time to wait is on a restaurant on a weekend. And my goodness, the wait times are just incredible. And, you know, recently one of my old friends, he came to visit us from Korea. And he, he was a West Coast graduate. And um, we call him Uncle Gilbert. And he came and brought his family to, back to America. And it was just a great time fellowshipping with him. And he hadn't been to America in 10 years. And one of his most cherished memories in America was the Chipotle chicken pasta at Cheesecake Factory. So, you know, we're like, okay, well, we've got to take you to Cheesecake Factory. So it was a Saturday night, and our family decides, okay, we've got to take Uncle Gilbert and his family to this restaurant. So we're, we're getting in line, and we decide, you know what, we're going to get there early. We're going to get there about 4 p.m. And so we're, I'm standing in line to, to make the reservation, and the lady asks for my name. I give her my name. And I put, in the uh, I put in the party for about nine people and she types in the computer and then she looks up at me and she says, okay, it'll be three hours waiting time. Whoa, I've got church tomorrow, lady. I mean, we can't wait for three hours. And I'm thinking, what are we gonna do? And I'm hungry at this point because I skipped lunch that day because, you know, the Cheesecake Factory bread, it's unlimited. And, you know, I wanted to get fat off of that. So I didn't skip lunch. So I'm hungry, I'm hangry. And, you know, I heard that three hours wait time. So I'm thinking, we can't do this, but, you know, my parents, they're like, let's just wait, and we're just going to wait out. So we're kind of just enjoying some time around the area, and an hour and a half goes by, and I'm, I'm fed up. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm mad. I can't smile anymore. You know, I can't enjoy the fellowship. So I decide, you know what, I'm going to take it upon myself, and I'm going to figure this thing out. So I walk back into the Cheesecake uh, Factory restaurant, and I'm waiting in line, and there's two groups in front of me, 
And the first group goes up to the lady and she says, um, party of four. So the lady types in her computer and she looks back up and she says, that's gonna be a 20 minute wait time. So I'm thinking, what in the world? You know, why is she 20 minute? Why are we three hours? So I'm just kind of contemplating this thing and the next person in front of me, they go up there and they're about a party of six and they go up to the um, lady at the front and she says also to them, 20 minute wait time. So I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? So I finally get up to the front and I'm saying, okay, um, can I check on my reservation for nine? And the lady types in her computer and she says, oh, you have about an hour and a half waiting. So I'm like, oh man, okay, let me ask you this. If I get a party of four and I get a party of five and then you put those two tables together, how long would that take? This lady thinks about it and she types in her computer and she says, oh, that's going to be 20 minutes. So, you know, I'm like, what in the world? So, I, you know, I'm like, go ahead, put it in. And the funny part was we waited 20 minutes. We got seated at our table and she put us all on the same table. So, you know, so I was super thankful for that. But I remember I was just thinking, I am not waiting three hours. And I try to use all my power and all the ability that I had to, to get faster, to be seated down because we were all hungry. And just waiting is just horrible. No one likes to wait and, you know, these are just some silly examples of, of waiting when it's, it's not that big of a deal. You know, when it's not that serious. But oftentimes there are situations in life where it is a big deal. You know, you may be a time where you're in the hospital and you're waiting for a test result. Or maybe you're waiting beside the bed of a loved one and you don't know what's going to happen, whether they're going to wake up or what the case may be. Or maybe you're waiting for a cancer result or, or whatever the case may be. Maybe you're in here today and you're, you're waiting for a job. Maybe you have financial problems and, and you're wondering, God, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to send my kids to school? Or how am I going to take care of all of the financial difficulties that are, that are in my life? Or maybe you're waiting for a family member to come back to Christ. Or maybe a wayward son or daughter. And you're just praying and you're praying and you're waiting upon the Lord. But you begin to lose hope. And you begin to lose strength. We see in this passage that Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, just heard some bad news in chapter 39. God just pronounced judgment on Judah and Hezekiah. He's showing the, the, the riches and all the stuff that Israel has to the kings of Babylon or the king of Babylon. And, and God pronounces judgment. He says, hey, because you did that, Judah's now going to be under captivity by Babylon. The Bible says in chapter 39, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. How many of you would agree this is not a good situation? This is not good news. And we see that if we study the Bible, the book of Isaiah is broken up into two distinct sections. One, chapter 1 through 39, and the other, chapter 40 through 66. And this chapter 40, where we're here tonight, is the breaking point of this section section. And we see that God, although he just announced in chapter 39, although he just said that, hey, Judah, you are going to be taken under captivity from Babylon. They're going to take everything and nothing shall be left. Notice in verse, or chapter 40, verse 1, the very first words are, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. You see, God is merciful that despite their sin, God offered words of comfort and grace. And the section of chapters 40 through 66 speaks of the grace of God. Isaiah is basically saying, hey, in the future, you're going to be carried away into Babylon. Hey, it's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be storms of life and, and trials and difficulties. And, and you're going to lose strength and feel that you have nothing left. But take comfort. Because God is still in control. And he brings this chapter to the climax in verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You see, a lot of people, we, we tend to like the end of that verse. We, we tend to focus on the, oh, we're going to renew our strength and we shall mount up with wings as eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. And that's an amazing promise. But the key to this passage that the key to this, this um, strength is not getting through the difficult times in our own strength. It, it's not trying to get past the line and, and saying, God, I'm not going to wait, but I'm going to try and get through this with my own strength. No, the key is waiting upon the Lord. Have you been waiting upon the Lord? In the difficulties and trials of our life, have you waited upon the Lord 
to renew your strength? Or have you depended on yourself to get through? Have you been waiting on God's provision or your next paycheck? Have you been waiting upon God's providence or a prescription from the hospital or, or some other form of method that's not from the Lord? Are you waiting upon the Lord? Well, tonight from God's word, let us look at three essential prerequisites of waiting and how we can wait upon the Lord. First, we see that in order to wait, we must first recognize his position. Recognize his position. Almost the entire chapter of Isaiah 40 just magnifies the Lord and exalts his position. And in verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah sets up the rest of the verses to follow with a statement of this. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Oftentimes we get so distracted by our circumstances. We get disheartened by our culture and the world around us that we, we know with the head knowledge that, God, I know you're good, and God, I know you're all-powerful, and that you can do anything but we tend to forget who he is and we tend to place God in our little box and, and that is why we do not truly wait upon him. You see, in order for us to wait, we must truly recognize his position. Who is God? Who is God? Or yet a better question, who is God to me? Is he a genie in a bottle that I just call upon whenever I need something and all the other times I can just walk away? Is he a God that it's, he's only present when, when it's only when it's convenient for me, but any, any other time I'm just going to walk on my own path? Who is God to us? Well, church family, from Isaiah chapter 40, behold your God. Look down in verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in the balance? God. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding? God. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Behold, um, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? The workman melteth the graven image, and the goldsmith smreadeth it over with gold and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that hath no oblation chooses the tree that will not rot, and he seeketh upon him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image, then shall not be moved. But have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, and stretcheth out as heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stalk shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Watch this. Lift up your eyes on high. Church family, lift up your eyes on high and behold who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Behold your God. What a mighty God we serve this night. And he is worthy to be um, praised and he is worthy to be worshipped. And why should we wait tonight? Because he is God and he can do anything. And take heart, Christian. You can wait today because he is good and that he can do anything for he is omnipotent. The Bible says in Matthew 19, 26, with, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. But sometimes it's, we look at the situations around us and we begin to lose heart and, and faint. We begin to think, how am I going to pay the bills? 
Uh, uh, how is this situation at work going to resolve itself? Uh, uh, will my marriage ever be restored? Will the cancer ever go away? And even after knowing all of this, knowing how great God is and how wonderful he is, sometimes it can be difficult to trust and wait upon him. We begin to doubt. And this is what happened in verse 27. You see, Jacob and Israel, they began to say, my way is hid from the Lord. My judgment is passed over from my God. Just being transparent here. There have been times where I felt like that. Maybe there's been some of you who felt like that as well. God, you are almighty and you are exalted, but do you even care? God, do you, do you notice I'm struggling? Uh, uh, do, do you recognize my situation? Uh, uh, do you even care about me? My way is hid from the Lord. And my judgment, my problems are passed over from my God. And it is at this moment that the Spirit of God whispers into my heart, Why sayest thou these things? Hast thou not known? Hey, haven't you heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Watch this. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. This is the part that just blows me away. I just shared with you all who God is in the best way that I could. And obviously our God is unfathomable. He, he is in, incomprehensible and he is all powerful and all knowing and all present. He is exalted and he is the God that sits upon the circle of the earth. He is the God where all the nations are as a drop of a bucket. He is the God where he measures out the waters in the hollow of his hand and he spans out the heavens with, with just his fingertips and he is just amazing God. Yet that God infinitely cares about me and he infinitely cares about you. That the infinite God, infinite in all of his attributes, infinite in all of his, his glory and his, his honor, that he would come and he would measure out the, the depth of the galaxy and throughout millions of galaxies in our universe, he would come to an insignificant galaxy called the Milky Way. And in the Milky Way, he would come to an insignificant place called Earth. And in this insignificant place called Earth, he would come to an insignificant state called California and into an insignificant city called Lancaster and into this insignificant heart. And he says, I love you. I gave my only son for you. I gave everything. I spared not my son for you. Hey, I've got a plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. And if I can give you my son, if I can die on the cross for you and so that you can have a home in heaven, surely I can take care of everything else. Surely I can, I can be there with your, your marital problems. I can help there. Hey, lean on me. Trust in me because I am God. Psalm 8 through 4, it says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? And then I love this. Jesus said in Matthew, Hey, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You tired tonight, church family? You feel like you can't get through it any longer? You're at your wit's end? You're heavy laden? Then come unto Jesus and say, God, I recognize your position. God, I cannot do this by myself. And Lord, I'm going to wait upon you and he will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, there's a famous short story you may have heard about. It's called Footprints in the Sand. And I want to read it to you tonight. One night I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to the Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand and I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and the saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I decided to ask the Lord about it. And I said, Lord, you, you said once I decided to follow you, that you'd walk with me all along the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, 
There was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. God whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. The will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake thee. Purest Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I want to encourage you, church family. A lot of times we're good fishermen. We like to cast it out on the Lord and then reel it back in. And God, no, that's mine. And, and then we say, oh God, I can't take it anymore. And we cast it back out and then we like to reel it back in. But I want to encourage you, cast all your care upon him. Just leave it out for him, for he careth for you. And for the sake of time, um, I can't read you the whole chapter, but I want to encourage you to read Psalm chapter 31. This is an amazing chapter, Psalm chapter 31. And David, he's extremely discouraged in this passage and his enemies are encompassing him. But David just writes and he writes a beautiful paragraph at the very end. And he says this, but he writes, but I trusted in thee. He's going through all this discouragement, this, this, this trials and this troubles. He says, but I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. You're not just the God of the church. You're not just the God of my fathers. You're my God. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord. Lord, prove me now herewith. Show me that your power, show me you can come through. For I have called upon me, or call, uh, called upon thee. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. I love this part. David saying, for I said in my haste, I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. I've been there so many times as well. For I said in my haste, I've cut off before mine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. David is saying, oh, love the Lord, church family. For the Lord preserveth the faithful. He preserves the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. This is my favorite part. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. All ye that hope in the Lord. If we're going to wait on the Lord tonight, we must recognize his position. But secondly today, we must relinquish our power. We must rel relinquish our power. Notice in verse 29, it says this. He giveth power to the strong. No, that's not what it says. He, he gives power to the person who thinks he can get through it on his own. No. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. You see, God has all power. He's omnipotent, and we know this. The Bible says in Jeremiah 32, All Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and stretched thy arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. And I'm so thankful we serve an omnipotent God. But that omnipotent power that he possesses, he can only give that power to the faint. Someone who is saying, Lord, I am completely and totally dependent on you. We must relinquish our power. You know, when I was growing up, I always wanted to show off how strong I was. And, you know, and I would always, you know, around the house, I would try and arm wrestle all of my siblings and my parents. And, you know, I would go to my sister and, you know, I'd beat her. And I'd go up to my brother and, you know, I'd beat him. And then I'd go up to my mom and then she'd beat me. But, you know, I just always wanted to show off my strength. And, you know, as I grew up, obviously the strength improved. And... I always thought that the epitome of the strength test, the highest standard of the strength test is a pickle jar. <laughs> when mom pulled these out, oh man, I was ready. Man, I could smell it a mile away. And man, I was there. As soon as she grabbed it out of the pantry, boom, my hand was ready on top of my mom. I've got to do this. This is the, this is the test of manhood here. So... My mom being the kind mom she is, and she handed it over to me, and I remember I would come over, and I would grab the pickle jar, and I would <laughs> And I would struggle and try and try, and I just could never open the pickle jar. And I would always hate doing this, but I would say, "Dad, I need some help with the pickle jar." My dad, you know, he'd be acting like he wasn't paying attention, but he'd be on the couch going like, "What's on?" I'm like, I need help with the pickle jar. I'm like, what? I need help with the pickle jar. 
my dad would kind of have a smirk on his face and he'd kind of puff out his chest and walk on over and like, give me that, son. And he'd open the pickle jar. And I'd be like, I weakened that for you. You know, my dad, you know, he, has, he always would come and help. And man, he loved doing it. He loved showing off his strength. And, you know, my mom would be like, ooh, like, look at that. And, you know, it's just <laughs> not great for me to watch. But, you know, I always thought of that. You know, I always tried so hard and just to open that little pickle jar. And you see, my dad, he had all the power to open that lid at any time. But I was trying so hard in my own power to take off the lid. And it was only when I asked my dad to open it that it finally came off. I want to tell you something, church family. Don't try to go through the trials in your own strength. Don't try to do it in your own power because you're going to find out that it is impossible, that you cannot do it. You don't have the strength, but your father does. And if you would just, all you need to do is simply come up to him and say, God, Father, I need your strength. God, I cannot do this on my own. God, I cannot, I cannot get through this problem. And I need to completely, I'm trusting in you completely. And I, I'm completely dependent upon you. And I'm trusting in you for our finances. And God, I'm trusting in you with our marriage. And God, I'm trusting with you with this uh, health problems or trials or whatever the case may be. And your father in heaven, man, he looks down from heaven and he's got a big smile. I was waiting for you to ask, son. I was waiting for you to ask, daughter. And he loves proving himself strong. He loves showing off. Our God's a show off. He loves showing off how great he is. And man, he'll come over in your life and he'll give you the strength. He'll give you his power. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And he will give you his strength. When you come to the place that God is all you have, you'll find that he is all you need. But not only tonight must we recognize his position. Not only tonight must we relinquish our power. Finally tonight, let us redeem his promises. Verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord, that next word, shall renew their strength. That's a promise. You know, like I said earlier, this message. Everyone loves that part. They love the mounting up with wings as eagles. They love the renewing the strength. But the key here is that waiting. And, and it's, it's not easy to preach that part, but the key is waiting. And, and the word wait here has several connotations. The first is that it's, it's patient waiting. You know, waiting, I hate to break it to you, but it might take some time. Waiting is a patient waiting. You know, it may take some days. It may take some weeks some months, maybe some years, maybe some decades. But it's waiting. It involves time. And some of us, it may be an extraordinary amount of time, but we must wait upon him. But not only is it a patient waiting, the second word, this, the, the connotation of this word is that it means to hope in. To, it's an expectation. I, hey, God, you've, you've, I've recognized your position. God, that, that you are so great, that you are so good, and despite all your greatness, that, Lord, that you, you care so much about me and that my problems, and God, I'm going to wait upon you because of that, and, and God, you said you're going to give me your power. God, God I don't want to do it in my own strength. I want to rely upon you, and I want to relinquish my power, and you're hoping and expecting upon the word of God that, God, if I wait upon you, if my hope, my expectation is set upon you, that you're going to renew my strength. And this word, it does not mean just to sit around and do nothing, not to twiddle your thumbs. Okay, God, I'm waiting. No, it, it implies action. It implies an expectation that, God, I'm hoping for you to do something in my life. I'm hoping for you to work here. And by the way, waiting time is never wasting time. Let me say it one more time. Waiting time is never wasting time. God always has you in those seasons of waiting upon him and for whatever reason, but God wants you to wait upon him and you know, when we wait upon the Lord, it is then that he renews our strength. This word renews, it means to change, he, that he takes our human strength that we cannot get through and he puts on his strength in us. And, and notice that it's not, his, it's not the removal of the trial, it's the strength to walk through it. And this is an amazing fact here. And I love this, this, this analogy. It says, and when our strength is renewed, we shall mount up with wings as eagles. We shall run and not be weary and we shall walk and not faint. I think the picture of mounting up with wings as eagles 
is such a perfect analogy. Now, obviously it is because it's from the Bible, but this picture is so beautiful. If you study the eagle, you're going to find that it's not like other birds. You know, you have the hummingbirds like, you know, it's flying really fast, beating its wings, and you can't even see it. But the eagle, it doesn't, it doesn't flap its wings. You see, the eagle, it might do it so for just a quick start, but the eagle relies on a technique of flying known as soaring. You see, well, it's not that it's flapping its wings really hard, but it is relying on the air currents and the, the thermal updrafts to keep it into the air and to soar. You see, it does not rely on its own wing strength. It doesn't, it doesn't try to beat against the wind, but instead uses the strength of the air currents to keep it flying. But one of the coolest aspects of the eagle that I find interesting as I was studying out the eagle is that during a storm, I don't know if you knew this, during a storm, an eagle will take shelter, just like any other bird, it'll, it'll hide. But in a situation where there is no escape, in a situation where there's no place to go, no place to land, no place to hide, when the eagle is stuck in the middle of the storm and cannot hide, you know what it does? It stretches out its wings and it waits for the thermal updraft of a storm to carry it high above the clouds where it's peaceful and totally above the storm. You see, it doesn't try and flap its way out of the storm. It knows that's impossible. It can't beat the wind. But what it'll do is it'll stretch out its arms. It'll stretch out its wings. And it'll wait for that pressure. And yes, the eagle knows that, hey, the only way to get out of the storm is to ride on a greater force that will take it through it. Christian, there are going to be some storms in our life where we feel trapped. That there is no way out that there are trials surrounding us and it, it almost feels suffocating. But just remember in that moment to stretch out your hands and say, God, I need your strength. God, I need you and I'm completely trusting in you and depending on you and with outstretched arms. Relinquish our power and recognize this, his, your, his position and wait upon the Lord. And hey, it might be rough. The storms of life might be beating down on you, the rain, the wind pressure, but God will renew your strength and you're going to catch the updraft of his love and updraft of his strength and he's going to carry you not to remove the storm, but to carry you through it. Whatever is out of our control is in the will of God for our lives. And maybe the storms in your life are just so that one day you can high, uh, fly above the storms and you can say, God, look at how you brought me through here. Look at how, Lord, you, you took me out of here. You're, you're so great and you're so good and, and all glory goes to you. And maybe that's why the storms are in your life and that you can look back and give God all the glory. You know, Joseph was in the perfect will of God. And you know where that led him? Prison. Scholars say that it took anywhere from two years to 13 years in that prison. And we don't know for sure, but he was in there for something he didn't even do. But Joseph waited upon the Lord. The disciples, God told him to cross over on the other side. And they were in the will of God. Literally, God told him to, Jesus told him to cross over the other side. And what did they find in the middle of the sea? They were in a storm, and not just any storm, a storm enough to scare experienced fishermen. I don't know about you, but I don't know what would, those people were on waves their entire life, but this was something so bad, it scared them. But they were in the will of God. You see, the will of God is not always this peace, water, it's not always promising that, hey, you're going to have a great life and you're going to be happy and, you know, you're going to have strength and all this stuff. No, it's, it's despite the trials, despite the difficulties, that God's going to give you his strength to walk through it so that you would run and not be weary and walk and not faint. So today, we see that his ways are higher than our ways. and His thoughts are not our thoughts. And sometimes we cannot always know why God is placing us in certain situations. But always know, church family, that our God is faithful. He's always faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with that temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wait upon the Lord. Recognize his position. Relinquish our power. God, I can't do it. God, I need your power. God, I need your strength. And redeem his promises. God, I'm going to hope. I'm going to expect in you. God, I'm going to wait on your timing. God, it may not happen the way I want it to. It may not all work out the way I prayed, but God, I'm waiting on your timing and your way. And I'm going to expect and hope and redeem your promises. And when we wait upon him, then here's the fun part. Then God will renew our strength. We will mount up with wings as eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk 
and not faint. Have you been waiting on the Lord tonight? If you haven't, he's waiting for you. Wait upon the Lord and he will renew your strength.